There was a, a song we played before this. I can't even I can't even remember the words, but uh, but Joe knows what they are. Uh, I was just thinking of the thousands, maybe miss millions of little kids. When I look at our little kids here, so precious they are. There's millions of those that are crying out tonight right now. Those that are trafficked, those that are in, in uh, Ukraine, I mean, just kids that are calling unto God. And I, I would like us to kind of rend our heart to them. And when as Joe plays this song, maybe we, we can sing that for them. My children, this morning, I call you to walk with me. I know you're saying I walk with you now, but I'm calling you to walk in a deeper walk. Like Enoch of old, he walked with me. Like Moses, I spoke to him face to face. You see through a glass darkly now, but that vision, the darkness of it depends upon you. The closer you get to me, the more you will see. The closer you get to me, the more will be revealed to you. My word says, if you draw nigh to me, I draw nigh to you. And I'm calling to you today to draw nigh to me. I have great things to show you. I have great things to do through you. My word declares that in the end, your old men will dream dreams and your sons and daughters will have visions. I'm calling you to that. I'm calling you to revelation. I'm calling to all the possibilities there are in my kingdom if you draw near to me. Though, grace gospel, you may be small, you may be insignificant in the world's eyes, but I see you. I see the potential you have. You must draw near to me so you can see the potential. You are not limited to Isani County. You are not limited to Minnesota. By faith, you can reach to every part of this world and touch it. But you need my revelation. It can't be done on your own. That's why I'm asking you to take my hand, walk with me, draw near to me, and I'll show each one of you what I desire of you to do. And I will give you revelation so that when you pray, it's not out of the birth out of you, but it's birth out of my spirit. And what's birth out of my spirit will take place. It will come to pass. I love you, my children. And I desire you to draw near to me so I can wrap my arms around you, so I can walk alongside of you, so I can speak to you daily, so I can heal your wounds, so I can give you revelation concerning your family, concerning your community, concerning the world, that you may be my chosen and flow in my spirit. We're going to dismiss the children, but listen to me now. Third grade through sixth grade stay in this week. They're going to be in, in with us. 
So I guess we just dismiss up to second grade. Chuck, would you come? Morning. Morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Well, it's good. It's the first time here I've been in the uh, sanctuary since it was remodeled. It's good. You did a good job. Uh, I've always felt buildings should be neutral. And what I mean by that is they don't distract either by being too extravagant or, man, don't they ever clean the bathrooms, says the visitor. But you want it to be neutral. And this is good. This is good. Um, I saw a bunch of adults leave. Are they going to be doing the children's church or are they coming back? Because I want to... uh, Try to get everybody on the same sheet of music. Praise God. Here they come. How many believe children, third grade or sixth grade, can understand the gospel and understand truth? Absolutely. Sometimes when the Spirit of God is poured out, There's a prophetic release to young people, children, profound. What comes out of their mouth. Samuel was seven or eight, maybe. His first prophecy was bone chilling. And he was afraid to give it. Eli had enough wisdom, even though he was blind, give it or worse will come upon you, young man. So he gave it. The Bible says of Samuel, not one of his words fell to the ground. That's an amazing testimony when you think about it. That means God had him backed totally because he had an awesome relationship with God. Good to see you, Marlon. Looking younger every year. I get it, Marlon. Praise God. Father, we just love you and need you. We surrender our hearts to you this day. Awesome days. End time days. Lord, we ask for your uh, help and discernment. And we trust you for that. Help me to articulate your heart, both in content and tone, so that we're impacted and we leave changed, or at least a desire to change. So wake up your people, Lord, in these critical hours. Time is short. Okay, we started the timer. Praise God. Time is short. When the Lord gives me a word, usually it's what I would call a circular message. What I mean by that is it's more than one church. It tends to be a bit regional. And as I go from church to church, then it usually gets tailor-made a bit and tweaked, edited, some taken away, some added to. And I was last Saturday night in Wadena, actually Staples. There's a beautiful Timberlake Hotel there, and that's where the church puts me up uh, when I speak in Wadena. And I was very much intent on speaking on 2 Timothy 
2, which is still a very current word right, right now. And those are the last words of Paul to his blessed spiritual son, Timothy. Paul knew he was about to die soon. And so you always read 2 Timothy 2 with that backdrop. Obviously, what's v- really important to Paul comes through in that letter. Timothy was in the battle of his life, pastoring, leading Ephesus, witchcraft center of the world. So there's a lot of pressure on him. So Paul's trying to build him up and help him in the journey. And I had no peace. I had no peace last Saturday on that message. So I just got before the Lord, and what I do then is I just begin to pray in tongues. I always trust my prayer language more than my earthly prayer language. Always. Because when you pray in the Spirit, you're praying according to the mind of the Spirit. It's safe ground. When you pray in your mind, sometimes it'll trick you because your heart will play games. And so I was just praying in the Spirit for quite a while, and then I sat down in a chair, and I'm telling you, the presence of God, it's like a weight. And it was so simple. You are in the last days. Now, you've got to pay attention to that phrase, last days, because there's a general understanding. Peter said, when the Spirit of God was poured out, quotes Joel, in the last days I will pour out my Spirit. So they thought they were in the last days then, and in a sense, generally speaking, they were. But there is a time just prior to the coming of Christ that the Bible puts a bullseye on prophetically called the last days. Uh, Paul, uh, as an apostle, a messenger of God, at times would slip into a serious revelation concerning your day and my day that we're living in. Read 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's like reading newspaper headlines. That's a chapter of Scripture you want to be very, very familiar with, become more familiar with. So how many would bear witness witness with me right now that we are in the last days? Okay, what that means is that you live with that mindset, with the understanding that we could be seeing Jesus face to face pretty soon. Now, for some, that's a big time, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. And for others, that's a really scary time, particularly if you're lost. So we're in the last days. Then the Lord downloaded, after that little simple phrase, Daniel, the book of Daniel. We will end up there hopefully today before I leave uh, and look at some highlights. The book of Daniel is a very, very, very now book for you to be reading, for you to become familiar with some of the most stunning prophecies in the entire Scripture. They rock you when you understand what Daniel saw. And we, what we need to understand is, how did he get there? How could he come to that place of intimacy with the Lord to hear that kind of specific word from the Lord? Many, many centuries before it would even pass or come. So we're in the last days. Now, as I'm driving up today, the Lord now begins to build. I, you know, this is kind of, we're, we're in a note-free zone. I could be here maybe five minutes. We could be here a while. We just have to trust the Holy Spirit. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit that he's going to quicken to me what you need to hear. And it's all about equipping, being edified, built up, encouraged. Great songs today. Good song of the Lord. Good song of the Lord there prophetically. Andrea. So I felt the Lord driving up today said, I'm going to give you a title. Normally, I get all kinds of stuff, and then 
Finding a title is the hardest thing. End time boot camp. I want you to set up an end time boot camp in your messages. So that's what we're going to do. By the way, before I continue, uh, how many would say, amen, you're in the right place at the right time for such a time as this in this facility, on this piece of property? Do you have a strong witness to that? All right, do you understand the Lord has a whole lot bigger plans than you might think, and a whole lot more than, good grief, we got a nice Sunday morning place yeah. to meet in. You might want to look in, and here's what I want to challenge you. As leaders and as a church, begin to seek God and get prophetic direction for this property. Does you want to do a camp meeting? Ooh. Do you want to get uh, water piped in here and electricity piped in for trailers to plug in? There's all kinds of things, and you just can't throw darts to the board. You've got to hear the Lord. So hear him, please. Hear him, please. There's a lot more at stake here. Feeding the poor, possibly. All kinds of, that's what's so exciting about coming into a whole new chapter like this, that this physical building represents, I encouraged Tom for a while, that, hey, it's time to move. And so when this all happened, I'm amen, I'm amen, I'm amen. It's so great to have a location. You don't need a word of knowledge to find The hidden life is over. It's time to impact the world. And I think that prophecy kind of spoke to some of that, didn't it? End time boot camp. Boy, I'd like to just tell you right now. Put your Bibles away. Get out paper and start writing. Here's what I mean. I'll give you scripture, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, but I want you to list the seven doctrines of the faith. In Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Not only list those seven doctrines, but be able to teach each one to at least a, a, a sixth grade level, which would mean you've got to be on your toes because that sixth grader can understand a lot. What would you write? Would you list all seven? It's okay if you're shaking your head, which I see. Don't get condemned. But here's the challenge. According to the writer of Hebrews, that's called the milk of the word. Whoa. If this is milk, what is meat? Praise the Lord. So let's get rooted and grounded in the milk of the word. Okay, quiz number two. Can you tell me the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit? Nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Where would they be found? 1 Corinthians 12. Nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Parents, your children need to know what the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are. They can learn them quick. They'll probably learn them quicker than you. There's nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5. I want you to tell me everything you know about what's called the Olivet Discourse. How important is that? Ooh, that's pretty important. That would be Matthew 24 and 25. How important is it? Well, this was instructions from Jesus to his disciples when they asked him a pretty simple question, as he makes this unbelievable declaration that, you see that temple? There's coming a day when not one stone will be left. And that judgment was so specific and so deep and so profound, not one stone was left. That happened in 70 AD. Luke chapter 17 is... Also a chapter about end times, and there's two guys in Luke 17 that Jesus uses when he says, and it will be just like, 
Do you remember who those two are? The days of Noah. And it would have been good if you had just left it at Noah, but also the days of, ooh, bummer. Now, as I speak, Lot's in heaven, but he's in inheritance less and come into it. He was a mess for various reasons, which ties into the book of Daniel, now that I think about it. So it's like Jesus is saying there's going to be two type of believers in the last days. Some are going to be just like Noah. Praise God. You know what it says about Noah? He sought the Lord in the framework of severe impending judgment, and he heard God. Here's what the Bible says about Noah. He, we sang it today a lot, quite a bit, actually. He found grace. I would say in the last days, you want to find grace. And not just some grace. Overflowing grace. Abundant grace. Powerful grace. That would be an interesting thing for you to write down. Now, give me all the key scriptures in the New Testament that speak about grace. And the prominence of grace in the life of the believer. See that? Calvary, that did a number on the Old Covenant. Shut it down. It made it of none effect because it was very limited in what it could do. So there's now a new covenant of grace. That's where we're living, child of God. And you have and I have a privilege to live a life filled with grace. And that grace will get you through any problem, every difficulty, every hurdle. It will get you through every valley. It will protect you on every mountaintop. And that grace will sustain your life forever. By the way, there's enough for each of us because Jesus is full of grace and truth. In fact, you can even say grace is a person before it's a doctrine and you'd be on safe ground, theologically. Truth is first a person. Then it's truth, full of grace. Where was I when I just got off? On, where was I before that? I thought I was on the track of something. Say again. Abraham, uh, Noah and Lot. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, to the prophecy and to the point, the deeper you get into the heart of God, the better you'll hear the heart of God. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you'll see better. You'll hear better. We're in a day and age when we, it is profoundly important that you hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. You don't want to be missing this. There's dramas being played out. Right now, it's Ukraine. I was thinking of the Tower of Siloam. Don't think you're any more righteous than Ukraine or unrighteous than Ukraine. Their shaking time has come. And God is dealing with a lot of stuff. Please hear the Spirit of the Lord rather than get all your revelation from cable TV. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He got so close to the heart of God. What he did then is he had this incredible revelation that was ridiculous. He was mocked. He was laughed at. It took him 120 years to build it. And the whole time he's building it, he's preaching. And nobody's listening except his wife and kids, I guess. I think at times they even thought he was nuts. Honey, what? tell me again. Run that thing by me. Well, we got to build this thing. I know, honey, but good grief. This is really big. Uh, I, I, this is really big. 
you sure we need all this room? It's you and I and the kids right now that are kind of gravitating towards your message. And that's all that would gravitate, by the way. And he built that thing. They got a replica of it down, where is it, in Tennessee or Kentucky? I got to visit that thing. I guess it's pretty amazing. There was room for all the animals. There was room for the whole thing. And the dimensions of it make it incredibly safe to sail in. <clears throat> given a serious storm. By the way, there's no rudder. There's no sails. God is the pilot of this ship. And he got specific direction from the Lord. All those years, maybe year 110, the wife's fed up. The kids are getting a little bit squeamish, Dad. And then you get to about year 120 and the clouds get dark. And they build up. It's ominous. The wind begins to pick up. And the Bible says it breaks open. Not just from above, but from below. And it didn't take long before that Ark gets lifted up. And then the wife and children look at dad. Tears flowing down their cheeks. As they hear the screams outside. Thank you. For building this. Come on, Dad, are you building a boat for your family? That will bring them to a place of safety. It's on Mount Ararat as I speak. I could say, thus saith the Lord, but I'll just give you my prophetic hunch. Because I really believe in the mercy of God, the love of God, the grace of God, I really do. I believe in the patience of God, the long-suffering of God. I believe in the character of Jesus who welcomes those who are broken and messed up and miserable. Don't be shocked if in the near future there's a worldwide broadcast. We found the boat. Um, a guy by the name of Ferdinand Navarre found that boat in about 1955, came down from Mount Ararat with some of the wood that the boat is made of. An astronaut, a born-again astronaut that went to the moon, wanted to go to Mount Ararat. He initially had permission to go. I forget his name now. doesn't matter. But right at the last moment of his expedition, he was denied the permits. And right now, it's locked up there and encased in deep ice, waiting for God's major league love letter, merciful, check this out, scientific, evolutionary world. You might want to reconsider. Noah found grace. Noah found grace. Yeah. Lot... Peter says he's righteous. His soul was tormented. I get it. He married an unbeliever. That was mistake number one, big time. He got separated from his uncle, who was his voice. You see, Lot was an echo. There's no direct, and the Lord spoke to Lot. Hear me, please. Don't be an echo believer. During these days, you have a privilege to be a voice believer. You have a covenantal privilege to hear the voice of your shepherd. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will speak to you. He starts primarily here. That's objective speaking, but he also has that wonderful subjective, intuitive 
spontaneous, living words that come to us. How many know what I'm talking about? Come on. Lord Jesus, we need your voice. We need to hear you in a more clear. We need to get closer to your heart. So Luke 17 is two paths. See, I believe this. In the last days, in the last days, there's going to be apostolic churches, and there's going to be apostate churches. It's like two paths. In the more far this direction, good grief, you've got churches that claim to be churches who struggle even with the deity of Christ. There's more than one way to heaven. There's more than one road to heaven. You Christians are too narrow. You've got to broaden up, open up. We are in the last days. Boot camp. Tell me how to get saved. Pretend I'm an unbeliever right now and I'm coming to you right now. How do I go to heaven? How do I go to heaven? Can you help me? Uh, can you tell me the Romans road to salvation? Simple, powerful. Lord Jesus, boot camp. Tom could do a really good job telling you about fasting. And the important role of fasting in the life of the believer. You don't go to Chuck for that one. Anything known to man can get in that blender and it will come out. And by the time I drink it down, I will feel satisfied as if I just ate a full meal. Tom, I don't know, he went on a few 40-day fasts, I remember, back in the day. Uh, I'll tell you another really important foundational that will get you a long way in your walk with Jesus. Tell me everything you know about the fear of the Lord. How important is that? Chuck, uncle, brother. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. Now, don't get off track about the fear of God. Just study it. I did a thing on the fear of the Lord. I looked up every verse in the entire Bible on the fear of God. It took me a long time to get there. And it's an amazing thing. After I got done, I said, wow, what a gift. Yes. What a blessing. What a protection. Yes. All this can save you from so much unnecessary sorrow and anguish. It'll protect you. See, the fear of the Lord is... God's divine radar alarm protection system. And the number one person the fear of the Lord is designed to protect you from is God himself. Praise God. It's clean. It's pure. It's holy. There is a blessing, parents, on your children for those parents who fear God. And it goes right down the generation. Psalm 112, Psalm 118, fear of the Lord. Peter released some apostolic discipline in Acts 5. He wept the whole time he's doing it. He's a broken man himself. It wasn't too long ago he cursed that he even knew Jesus. So he stands before this couple, and he moves in discernment. He's broken, and the fear of God hits that local church they actually, unfortunately, die that morning or that day, carried out by the young men. And the fear of God came upon the whole church, and the power of God went to a whole other level, so much so that Peter's shadow begins to heal people. Whoa, that's pretty heavy. Exciting. Boot camp for end times. Be familiar. Now go with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel was taken 
to Babylon when Jerusalem was sacked by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we don't know exact what his age was, at least 15, 17, maybe 20, but get this now, he lives in Babylon the entire 70 years. Now, when he is sent to Babylon, it's judgment that has come upon Jerusalem. It's a stunning judgment. Uh, Israel has been long since dispersed, 722 B.C. So the ten tribes are gone, scattered throughout the nations, and you have Judah. you got Israel. Uh, Judah and Benjamin are two tribes. And then there's the prophetic cry to Judah. Walk with God. Stay close to God. Don't embrace that foreign invasion of idols. Uh, don't do what Israel did when they welcomed in Jezebel. Don't, don't go there. And Judah... Didn't listen. Jeremiah begins to prophesy. He'll prophesy for 23 years, and not one person actually converted. He's thrown in prison. He's beaten. He's a, he's a serious, serious prophet. A broken man. Costly to deliver the word of the Lord. And he had this prophecy of judgment to Babylon. He was mocked. He, there's all kinds of tests. Uh, don't go to Egypt. He says, if you go to Babylon, you'll have your life as a kind of reward. If you, if you don't obey what I'm saying, you're going to go into a whole other level of difficulty. And uh, off they go. And Daniel is one of them, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Four buddies. And now they're going off into the realm and the world of confusion. That's what Babylon means. Now, this breaks down in so many different ways. Whenever you and I come under times of even discipline or when God begins to deal with us, sometimes we go into a season of just like confusion. Uh, that's a good thing to recognize if it happens because that could be a way of God mercifully calling you back, not to confusion, but to revelation. Babylon means confusion, and so they're, they're, they're all there. And I'm sure there were many, many believers that were in Babylon saying, how in the heck did we get here? This makes no sense. Underestimating His holiness underestimating that even though God pleaded with them for decade after decade after decade, there comes a time. See, one of the things that I really, <laughs> when I rest, when I look at Ukraine or when I ponder Hitler or I ponder Stalin or I ponder Pol Pot, wicked, demonic, Killers, if there's nothing inside of you that cries out for justice, someday, it doesn't make any sense. Everybody will bow the knee. Every knee will bow. Aren't you glad you bowed it now? I think we sing that, don't we? And so Daniel is carried off to Babylon. And then verse 8, chapter 1. Daniel made up his mind. There, this is where it's at for many believers right now. I think the Spirit of God is saying it's time to once again make that decision. It's time to make that declaration over your life in the light of serious last days. And Daniel made up his mind he would not defile himself with the king's choice 
food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now, this is pretty serious because Nebuchadnezzar is a no-nonsense kind of king. He'll, 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 he'll kill you in a, and not even think twice about it if you displease him. So there's a lot at stake here. Uh, they, they are to enter the king's personal service. That was the invite. Can you say amen? Boy, would I love. Now let me just mess with this a little bit. I know it's Nebuchadnezzar, but boy, would I love to get into the king's personal service in these last days. I'm talking king of kings. Thank you very much. And Lord of lords. I'd like to be a friend, not just a servant. Why? Why? Because friends hear better. Friends are told things the others are not told. Well, that seems kind of, is God playing favorites? No, we're the ones that play favorites. So Daniel made up his mind, even though the challenge was to enter into the king's personal service, and, and uh, this, this commander, I'm trying to look for his name, it doesn't matter. He says, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths of your same age? Then you'll make me forfeit my head. I'm, I'm done. Daniel said, let's do this. Ten days. Let's just do a test for ten days, and then you check us out how we look. After ten days, we'll do our thing, and after ten days, the other guys do their thing. How many know Daniel and his three buddies look just fine? In fact, look like they put on weight. Praise God. And so they're in the king's personal service. Now that's compromise. Chapter one is compromise. Chapter one is test. Now chapter two is really interesting. Because chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar gets a very troubling dream and it really scared him, and it was heavy upon him, so he called all his magicians together and said, I want you to interpret the dream. Well, they've been doing that for quite a while, so they said, okay, king, fair enough. What's the dream? No, nah, no, nah, we're not messing around. This is too heavy. This is too important. Here's the deal. You got to tell me the dream first and then give me the interpretation. I want you to see their faces draining <laughs> as they go into panic mode. King, this has never happened before. This is an impossible request. I knew it. You guys have just concocted this cockamamie scheme to protect yourselves, and you're going to come up with the same excuse. No way. You're all dead men. Whoa. He actually put the, he put the death warrant out, and Daniel was one of them, and his three buddies. Daniel says to the king's rep, rep uh, why is he so upset? <laughs> What's going on here? And then he explains. He says, where is it, chapter 2? It's so classic. Verse 14, then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch. Verse 15, for what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time. We still have time. But here's what Paul says in the last days. Ephesians 5. Make the most of the time. 
that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. And Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they went into this serious, serious seek God mode. And they began to pray. Now, there's a classic statement. I'm not going to read it all. Beginning with verse 20, all the way down to verse 23. But what Daniel does when his life is on the line, and he's got to really press into the heart of God. I'm going back to that prophecy now again, where the invitation is there from the Lord. So please listen up. Daniel goes into this magnificent declaration of God and God's goodness and God's faithfulness who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness. You can just pick up any phrase there. To thee, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. Worship. For thou hast given me wisdom and power, even now thou hast made known to me what we requested of thee, for thou hast made known to us the king's matter. Take me to the king. All right, king, here's your dream. Lays it out. Here's what it means. That is a foundational dream for end times. There's going to be kingdoms, first, Babylon, second, Persia, third, Greece, and the fourth, Rome. Now, you have to understand, even Daniel didn't get super specific. He missed the time frame. I'll illustrate it in just a moment. But this dream is a foundational dream that takes you all the way to right up to right before Jesus comes back. And the key is the fourth kingdom. Because the fourth kingdom, way down the road, is going to be like iron and clay. And he concentrates on the toes. You know what's happening right now, body of Christ? Come on, the toes are wiggling. The toes are wiggling. And in the days of those kings, verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Come on. Say, thank you, Jesus. Lord. What does never mean? <laughs> never. In other words, all victorious, never be destroyed, eternal. And this is true of the kingdom, by the way, from the time of Calvary, that it is an eternal kingdom, and it doesn't matter all the shaking the other kingdoms go through to expose their fragile foolishness. I'm part of a kingdom that can't be shaken. Thank you, Lord. And it's eternal. It will never be destroyed. And of that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush. Woo. It will crush and put to end all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Last part of that goes down to verse 45. Inasmuch as we saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Please, child of God, understand what he's saying here. It's by the Spirit. Not by the flesh. This is totally a work of God and work of God's grace. And God's initiative. Oh, there's so much more I could go off into, but our time is, praise God. I think I, I thought I, I forget. I, Tom gets at me when I start talking about time. It can't be 12.02. So a little said and so far to still yet go. Say again? Part two. Let's go to verse 45. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great 
God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. The king is blown away. Wow. This is like the mother of all presbyteries. <laughs> he read his dream. He got it. I think there's a whole bunch of magicians that are really taking a deep breath too, aren't there? As they just kept their head for a little while longer. We're going to get jealous later on in the life of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face as the word of the Lord comes forth. So here's the point. Chapter 1, test of compromise. Chapter 1, test of compromise. Test of compromise, passed. Chapter 2, revelation. Profound revelation. This is the book of Daniel. It's foundational underpinning thread principle. The more you don't compromise, the deeper you go in revelation. And so we must choose now. Oh, by the way, chapter 3, it's fire. It went up from food to fire in a furnace. Chapter 6, it would be called a lion's den. Ooh, we're going to put the ante up a little bit higher. No compromise, profound revelation. I, I, I will stop there. Chapter 7, you look at the expanded, deeper, more specific, revelation Daniel receives concerning the last days. Compare it with chapter 2. He keeps pressing into God's heart. He keeps pressing into God's heart. That's all there is to it. Chapter 6. Lion's den. Chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. No more Sunday school stories. We've already done that. It's one big portion of Revelation. Some of the most stunning prophecies in the history of the church. Way to go, Daniel. I, I can't wait to meet him, really. Chapter 9 maybe has one of the most stunning, if not greatest, prophecies in the entire Old Testament because he predicts Calvary. Didn't even know it. He was just seeking God about the 70 years. That's what he was interested in because he knew time's up and he believed the word of the Lord. So he seeks God in chapter 9 about the 70 years and to his stunning amazement, he says, no, Daniel, Seven times seven has been decreed for the end of iniquity. Wow. You might want to read and read again. Well, I did that in Sunday school. I get it. The book of Daniel, please. The book of Daniel. Know your Bible. Go for the foundational truth. And let's start right now. I want you to just close your eyes. Come before the Lord in a moment. And I did, there it is. Did press it. Did it go? Stumbled on. Here we are, Lord. End days. End times. The birth pangs are increasing on the heels of a medical worldwide plague comes the nations at war. Birth pain. 
And the Lord's saying to each one of us, how close do you want to get? He invites gone out. Are you willing to not just deal with areas of compromise in your life, but kill them? It's only by grace I get it, but he, trust me, he'll give you grace to do it. He will give you grace. And that's between you and Jesus. I have my areas I'm working on. It's called the flesh. It's called my soul. It's called wasted time. It can be called anything. So you just, Holy Spirit, we ask you for your gracious, convicting ministry that leads us also to hope. Show us, Lord, areas that you want changed, corrected, adjusted, maybe totally eliminated. Father, help us. Don't let us play games with our soul. Don't let us play games with our lifestyle and all the choices that have made up this lifestyle. Help us. We need your help. We need your grace. We want to be Noah believers. We want to be Daniel believers. We want to be friends of Jesus during these days. We want our personal worship to take us to a whole nother level. And Lord, by your grace, we want to follow. We really do want to follow. I, I, I see the, I, I believe the Lord knows our hearts. And I believe you're sincere. You do want to follow. We get tripped up from time to time and get detoured once in a while. Lord, help us. Help us. So we just receive with gratitude revelation from the Holy Spirit yeah. for each of our lives and the accompanying grace to deal with it. In Jesus' name.